then. Thank you, Auntie Anne. That was a fantastic welcome. Um, I'm Stan Grant. Welcome you all here today. I want to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to pay my respects to the people of the lands wherever you're joining us from today. Um, a fantastic conversation we're going to have about homelessness, its impact, the experience of homelessness, and the hope that emerges as well. To set the scene, I wanted to start with some numbers and really sobering numbers that they are. Right now, there are almost 120,000 people experiencing homelessness across Australia. 120,000 people. That's a city, a city of people right now experiencing homelessness. Almost 40,000 in New South Wales where we are. When you consider the impact of homelessness and how people can emerge from that, consider also that the social housing wait list is more than 10 years. So a person experiencing homelessness now and hoping to move into social housing may have to wait 10 years. What happens in that 10 year period? In Sydney, over 800 people sleep rough or are in crisis housing. I wanna talk about youth because this is one of the really disturbing statistics as well. Youth homelessness in New South Wales has increased 117% from 2006 to 2016. We're failing another generation of our youth, a 117% increase. And we were hear uh, Auntie Anne there talking about Indigenous people, Indigenous communities. Of the children who were homeless on census night, four in 10, that's almost 40%, four in 10, identified as Indigenous Australians. Think of this, that Indigenous Australians are only 3% of the Australian population. It gives an indication of how the most vulnerable people are vulnerable. And we want to get from people who have had this experience of homelessness, a first-hand account of dealing with that and how you can emerge from that and where you find hope and the strength to go on. I want to introduce you to our panel now who are joining me here. Lizzie, beside me, is a 20-year-old woman with a lived experience of mental health issues, suicide ideation, homelessness, domestic and family violence. And Lizzie is currently, well, you can tell me what you're studying. What are you studying? I'm currently studying law and psychology at Notre Dame. Well, congratulations. And you've got your exams coming, Thank right? Thank you. Yes, I do. All right. Uncle Tony, um, next to me here, and I, I say uncle with great respect and reverence because Tony is an adopted one of us, an adopted one of my people, an adopted an Indigenous person in Australia. And we're, we're pleased to be able to say that. And that was an honour that was bestowed on you, Tony, right? That is correct. It was um, bestowed on me by Auntie Jean Phillips. Mm. Um, and I'm very grateful to her uh, for that honour. Uh, I do take it as quite a responsibility. And it is an honour, and, uh, and we're honoured to count you among us as well. Honoured to count all of you among us. Tony as well, just like Lizzie, has experienced all of those same things and, and, and homelessness. Tony is a volunteer team leader at the Rough Edges Community Cafe and is employed by the Urban Exposure Program, taking groups on walks around Darlinghurst and King's Cross, sharing his story on the way. Grace is next to, uh, to Uncle Tony, um, just like... Lizzie and Tony. Grace has experienced all of these things, the, the, the uh, issues of addiction and homelessness and, and health issues. Grace, tell us what you're doing now though. You're a peer, peer support worker. Yeah, so um, I work with people that have hepatitis and mm. I help them access treatment as well as um, talk about my experience with getting hepatitis and clearing hepatitis. And I also do the urban walks as well, which also is also peer work. Fantastic. And Ryan is with us as well. Ryan, um, team leader, at Rough Edges, um, supporting people experiencing homelessness and um, school teacher as well and, and youth leader? Yep, yeah, Okay. quite some time ago. Okay, yep. okay. And, and tell us just quickly about your work with Rough Edges. Yeah, so I've been working there for almost four years now. Um, and so my job is to basically oversee all the operations that we do, manage the, the volunteer base, which at this stage is about 130 to 150. Um, and of course, our number of staff, which is ever increasing at this stage, mm. so. 
Yeah. Great. Good work. Now, look, I, I wanted to start with a, a discussion about homelessness and what it means and how we define that. And feel free to, to jump in at any time when you want to. Um, don't, don't wait for me to ask the question. Jump in, you know, it's a conversation between us. I, I just wanted to start with, a, with my own story and my own observation about this. I often tell people about the experience of homelessness and people would look at me now and see me on television and think, well, homelessness, could you have experienced homelessness? For the first 14, 15 years of my life, my family did not have a home. We were an Aboriginal family. We were an itinerant family. We were a family moving from town to town. We didn't have permanent employment. Home was wherever we found it, often with relatives, moving in with other people, sometimes in caravans and sometimes in tents. And if we had a home, we'd move in there for a little while. It meant that I had to change school constantly. I changed schools 13 or 14 times before I was even into high school. So, you know, I, I wouldn't sit here and say that I share the same experiences as each of you do. But when we talk about homelessness, it can describe a whole range of experiences, isn't it? Uncle Tony, can I start with you and how you would define homelessness? Um, there's actually four definitions of homelessness that are used by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. There is primary homelessness, secondary homelessness, tertiary homelessness and inadequately housed. And what, what does that mean? They're, they're different grades, I suppose, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, um, primary homelessness is what people traditionally think of homelessness as. It's sleeping rough. It's sleeping in parks. It's sleeping in cars. Um, things like that. Um, secondary homelessness is when you do actually have a roof over your head, but it's not secure in, you don't, in the sense that you don't know how long you'll get to stay. It's things like couch surfing. Um, it's mm. things like staying in a men's hostel or a woman's refuge or a refuge. Um, homelessness is actually living in a boarding house. Um, people and, and, and that's considered still homelessness because it's not a permanent home, is it? Now, it's not a permanent home. Um, you can actually be thrown out of a boarding house at two o'clock in the morning for being three days late with the rent. I've seen people being... I was once asked to leave a boarding house when I was only three days in advance in the rent. Um, and they're even using things like licensee agreements, which come under the 1861 Innkeepers Act, right. which was originally set up to allow um, country publicans to provide... Um, booked accommodation for people like shearers and fruit pickers, but also get to kick them out in the middle of the night. So th this means they can move you on at any time. So, yes. so, so you have the primary, secondary, tertiary, and the fourth one, I think, is... Inadequately says? housed is basically when there's just too many people for that particular building, mm. um, that particular dwelling. That often relates to overseas students in the CBD. Mm. Where would you put yourself, Lizzie, in your experience of homelessness when you listen to those categorisations? Yeah, so for my experience, um, I was couch surfing. So as Tony mentioned, um, not knowing how long I was staying anywhere, um, it was always just temporary accommodation um, and, yeah, just no stability. Mm. Can I just also say to people that we're going to be hearing some tough things and people have experienced some tough things and I want to remind you that if anything we discuss tonight brings up issues for you, please reach out to the services available, Lifeline, 1800 Respect. So keep that in mind. Lizzie, and feel free at any time, if something's uncomfortable for you or you don't want to share something, we entirely understand. But what led to that for you? Yeah, so for me, I came from a family of domestic violence and complex trauma. So I'd grown up in with this family. Um, I went to a private school, had this very mm. privileged lifestyle. Um, from the outside in, it just looked like I was living a happy life. Um, behind closed doors, that wasn't the case. Um, I was experiencing all these things in addition to having mental health issues. So when I turned 18, I just knew I couldn't stay there any longer. And that's when I started couch surfing. Mm. And what about you, Grace? Um, homelessness, what does it mean for you and, and what factors contributed to your own experience of it? Um, oh, a lot. <laughs> um, it's, it feels weird starting from like when I was born, but I couldn't talk um, as a teenager like until I was in high school. So I wasn't good with reading. What, what, what do you mean? You, you, you... Well, I had verbal dyspraxia, so it's like dyslexia, but with talking. 
Right. Um, so and I was always very lonely and felt like very depressed, I think, because of that. And you, you speak so well now. And I'm wondering yeah, how... how I always say it's funny if I do public speaking now. <laughs> but how... I mean, when you say something like that, how does that present itself? Does that mean you, you didn't talk or you were... Well, Nervous everything about came talk? out opposite. Like, I remember pillow was hoggeth, bl- uh, blanket was googie. And you had a whole language. <laughs> yeah, and like in, in my brain it sounded like it was coming out normal, but it wasn't. I did six wow. years of speech therapy, and if you can't talk, you can't read and that sort of thing. So I thought I was dumb. And so I left school, school at 16. Um, and, yeah, I was just very depressed, and I really loved my parents and didn't want them to be. And I was depressed, and I was drinking at, like, 12. And so I thought, well, I'll move. And I'm saying a lot right now. But I thought, no, 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 oh, say and so I thought, well, I'll move out, then they won't know what I'm doing. And I had a job as a personal assistant at the time. It was a good job. Um, and then I moved into a boarding house, like, that day, and it didn't go well. It was all men, and one of the guys was asking me out all the time. And he's like, are we, are we friends? And I'm like, yes. And he started trying to kiss me all the time. And then I did boarding houses, share houses for a while, and then it was friends, friends' lounges, but then you could only do that for so long. Mm-hmm. Then it was squats, um, on the street a couple of nights, car for a while. Um, even you now when like, you walk past people's houses and I've got like a lounge out the front and just sleep on people's lounges out the front of their houses. Yeah. All sorts of places. And, and were you keep, still keeping this from your parents? Because you, you, you had a good home life, you Yeah, were they knew but they didn't know. Like I'd go, still go home every Sunday with my green bag and they'd wash my clothes and mum would just like say, you look tired. Um, but they told me like that I had to leave, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what, one of the things, Tony, that, again, some of the misconceptions around um, homelessness is that it is sleeping rough. Um, I said before there are about 800 people in Sydney right now who are sleeping rough, but that's, that's not all of the people who are experiencing homelessness. I think it's only about 8%, isn't it, total, ex- um, experience that's, sleeping that's rough? That's actually people in the Sydney... Um, Sydney City Council area. Right, right. Um, there's homeless people right all throughout. Um, and not everyone's sleeping rough, of course. Yeah, yeah. but there's people sleeping rough um, at Newtown. There's people sleeping rough out at Parramatta. Um, they're, they're sleeping rough in all sorts of places. And, of course, they're also um, couch surfing and they're in boarding houses all, all through Sydney. So there's, you know, lots more than just 800 people sleeping rough. Um, but there's, you know, there would have to be more than 10,000 people homeless in Sydney. Mm. There's a lot of people in the bush in the Hawkesbury as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's like like camping and the salvos goes out with bacon and eggs every week. Mm. Suppose if they're going to be homeless, they may as well be homeless somewhere nice. Well, well, you, you mentioned before, Lizzie, couch surfing. Was sleeping rough an experience for you at all at any point? No, it wasn't. Mm. So I never slept rough. I always had a roof over my, ha- roof over my head um, and I was lucky for that. Mm. Ryan... Um, you, you would experience all of this, of course, in, in your work. People, uh, and, and outwardly, people thinking this person doesn't fit the commonly held definition of what homelessness is. Yeah. And, abs- st- and still need support. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of surprised all the time, you know, uh, we have people that, that don't look homeless at all. Um, you know, they don't even... You, you know, fit that kind of stereotype yeah. in the slightest that are coming in for, for food and community. Um, and I just, I, I think it, it just kind of blows out your, your conceptions of, of what fits in that box in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, I mean, uh, sleeping rough accounts for 7% of, right. of uh, homelessness in Australia, um, which means there's you know, a, a multitude of other people struggling in different ways, as Tony has, has already outlined, um, that still come to us or, or go to other services for, for support in that way. Um, again, in, the, in the, the popular imagination, someone who is homeless is someone who's poor or someone who's disadvantaged or hasn't had access to education or employment. That's not true either, is it, Ryan? It's, it can be... Someone can find themselves in a homeless situation very easily. And people from backgrounds, like Lizzie was saying, private school background, Absolutely. apparently stable home and family, and you can still find yourself in that situation. I did a tour once and yeah. um, the, one of the teachers was like, she comes from Oatley, Oatley, that's nicer than where you guys live. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought that was funny. <laughs> it, it, and you must see this, Ryan. It can oh, happen of course, very easily. Yeah, I mean... I, 
it, it's always amazing to me when, when we really, when I really get to know someone that, that's coming to Rough Edges, um, where you sit down and speak with them for a while and they'll say something that just surprises you. So, you know, one time I spoke to a bloke who had been quite a successful architect mm -hmm. um, and owned his own firm and, and all that kind of thing. And one of the most eccentric people I've ever met in my life, I will say. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, ended up in homelessness and, and eventually he, he shared with me that it was um, after a, a breakdown, a, a mental health. And that, and that can happen a lot, isn't it? People oh, have experience a mental health episode yeah, and that triggers a spiral. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I, I, I find it really difficult to, um, to kind of draw connections between, between people or, or see the similarities. But I think one thing that stands out to me is, is trauma. Um, trauma tends to, be, um, tends to be present in a lot of people's stories. And that can be a job loss. That can be the end of a relationship. That can be a death in the family. That well, can be yeah. an injury, an illness. I mean, it can be so many things, can't it? Uh, absolutely. I mean, in Grace's story, the you know the the inability to to speak is um, is you know that would have been traumatic. horrible, mm -hmm. traumatic. Absolutely. Um, and so you know. We tend to see that in so many different people's stories. And being homeless causes a whole lot of more trauma. Absolutely. And then people use drugs because of trauma, but then you no know, addict hasn't had trauma from using as well. But I also think another reason there's so many homeless people is just there's no affordable housing in Sydney. Affordable housing is meant to be 25% of your income, but on average people are paying 50%. If you're below the poverty line, you pay 80% at least for a boarding house, which is one room, no wow. kitchen, share bathroom, horrible. <laughs> that, that's one of the things you're a big advocate of, Tony, isn't it? Is, is proper public housing. Yeah, that's right. Um, I'm living in... Uh, a privately leased place myself at the moment, but um, my older brother, David, was actually homeless for 30 years. He finished one year of a communications degree at university, yeah. then mental health issues arose for him, and he was homeless for 30 years before he was taken in first by the Wesley Mission um, for six months at Edward Eagle Lodge, and then spent a year with um, a Mission Australia living skills program in supported accommodation. And now he has been in... Um, housing department accommodation in Surrey Hills for the last 17 years. Mm. Um, and he has over 600 CDs. He's <laughs> written five <laughs> books of poetry. Wow. Of, um, yeah, and, you know, like, now he's settled. Now yeah. he can do these things. When, when you say something like that, and, and, you know, 30 years, and, and we sort of brush past that, when you said it, I just thought, thought 30 years, how does that happen? How does someone remain homeless for 30 years? Um, not enough support services. And it can happen easily. Yeah, I mean, mm. if the, uh, yeah, the Sisters of Charity did a great uh, deal of work helping David. Um, but, you know, if it hadn't been for them and uh, the other support services, he would still be homeless today um, and quite possibly would have died by now. Mm. Is there something you, you, you come across too, that the longevity of homelessness? Oh, absolutely. I, I think um, it's it's never, you know, in some cases. I, I, I was reading earlier uh, that that uh, when surveyed, I think something like sixteen percent of people that are homeless will just say, "I need affordable housing." Right. Fifty-two percent will say, "I need affordable housing plus short-term service uh, support." Uh, and then another, something like 26%, I, I can't remember exactly, will, will say, I need supported housing plus uh, intense uh, support. Mm. Which, and, and support in this case means social work, means counselling, um, all, all sort of services like that, medical support as well. Um, and so, you know, it, it's not as simple as just sticking someone in a house and going, right, away you go, yeah. You're done, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. off you go. Or, all good, um, because what what I mean on a very simple um, in a very simple case, it's like you take someone who's been living homeless for say five or six years. They're used to the noise of the street. They're used to waking up with people around them all the time. Stick them in a home home where there's four walls and they're completely on their own. 
how isolating. I mean, I mean, I imagine so the lonely. silence. I was so lonely. You're not Were you? Yeah. Uh, you're on the street and you're with other people all the time and you feel sorry for them. You're just sleeping in a squat with them. So you invite them back to your house and that's not helpful. Right. <laughs> but you can't, if, you know, you're just with them, you know. So then, yeah. But it just was so lonely. Tony, do you want to say something? I thought you, I felt like you wanted to say something then. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was actually going to give a plug for my brother's poetry. Who did that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's, That's like we're here say, he's written five books of poetry. And if you go to a street spirituality at wordpress.com um, and look for a street, street spirituality by David Marsh, you'll find his poetry. And he loves it when people do that. And I um, mean, it's actually brilliant poetry. Um, there was a, a professor of um, literature at Uni University of New South Wales who launched his last book. Um, because that's how good the poetry is. Yeah, well, keep an eye out for, uh, for David Marsh's poetry. Um, a big plug from his brother, Tony. I wanted to ask you, Lizzie, um, about the experience of homelessness. And again, feel free if, if you don't, you know, if this is difficult to talk about, but, you know, looking at your own biography, what you went through um, at such a young age, mental health issues, you talked about family violence, and suicide ideation. You're a young person. You've got this incredible future. You're incredibly bright, educated. You're studying at university. And yet you can still experience those things, can't you? Definitely. So when I um, hit my lowest of lows, I was couch surfing. I was actually currently studying at university. I was working three jobs um, and... I hit rock bottom. I couldn't see any way of getting out of the mental health issues I was in. And what, what do you mean? You say you say rock bottom. Mm. What what does that mean? What does that feel like? Is that a a sense of hopelessness? Is that that you can't see a way out? Yeah, you can't see a way out. And for me, I ended up um, overdosing in an attempt to take my own life. Um, I just couldn't could not see how I could get out of this situation, even despite going to school, having uni ahead of me. I just, it was like a black tunnel. How do you pull yourself out of that? If you're also, if you don't have the stability of family, if you don't have the stability of a home? Yeah, so I came out of ICU um, after fighting for my life. I came out, um, I tried, I had great, family, second families who tried to take me in, um, help me to keep fighting. Um, but I realised I just couldn't do it on my own. And that's when I went to the GP and I said, I need to go into mental health hospital. And so I had an admission of seven weeks. And the That's reason brave too, isn't it? To actually, how, how do you do that? How do you say, I'm going to take myself to the GP and ask for this? Because I knew the only other option was me not being here anymore and I couldn't do that to the people around me that loved me. So I owed it to them and I owed it to myself to try. So I was in hospital, as I said, for seven weeks and that was because they wouldn't release me until I had permanent accommodation. Um, so that's when I started getting in touch with youth housing. Mm. Uh, Grace, for you as well, um, the, the, how did that the mental health issues present themselves for you? Um, well, I remember when I moved, like, I was always very anxious and very, very depressed. Um, and then I just started covering up with drugs, I suppose. And then in, and then using drugs made, make it even worse. And I got involved, like, when you're homeless and a shame. And then I was in a domestic violent relationship. And, and then you stop using and all, like, the stuff comes back. Like, But, but, when, but when you say you stop using, like, that, that's easier to say. <laughs> um, but how? How, how do well, you, how do you just, deal I'll, with that? I'm very proud to say only 2% of people stop using heroin. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember thinking I'd be arrogant to think I could stop. But... Um, <laughs> And yeah, but I, it was quite a few things happened at once. I got arrested and I had a violent partner and I couldn't, we were like a codependent using relationship and I couldn't really ring the police if he was trying to attack me for my heroin or for money or whatever because 
I had for drugs. And he'd be screaming at the police, like, she's, she's got heroin and all stuff like that. So when I got arrested and I didn't, I'm like, well, and then I got him out of my house. But then the stress of getting him out of my house made my face collapse. I had Bell's palsy, but my um, mm. eye was down here, my lip was down there. It looked like I had a stroke and it was like that for years. It's still a little bit funny. Um, and then my parents also found out because I'd been arrested and I was worried about going to jail. I was on a, I technically went to jail, I got a min number, but I've never been. <laughs> so for three and a half years, I was just like getting, getting tested by parole and doing community service and I'm like, I've got to pull my head in. <laughs> and, and, and you managed? Yeah. To, I mean, that, that... I'm lucky because all those things happened at once because I wanted to before that. I was just so sick of being sick. Like I wanted to stop. I just didn't think I could. And then when I did all those things, I just thought I'll just stop for three and a half years and then it was just easier and easier and easier. And you also had your own experience with struggles with mental health. Uh, yeah, my my, stro- my mental health issues centred around uh, depression, um, and it started very early in childhood. It first um, became noticeable when I was six, and by the time I was eight, it was that bad that I was I, I ran a fever That's of very young forty one. Yeah, and you know, like a fever that high can kill someone, mm. um, and I had hallucinations that night that were absolutely terrifying. I thought I was going to die. I thought I'd already lost my mind. Um, in my early 20s, I actually had a bad acid trip, a bad LSD trip, on top of the Sydney Harbour Bridge at two o'clock in the morning. And that was far less terrifying than the nightmares I had, the, the hallucinations I had when I was eight. Mm, wow. um, and it just meant that I always felt that no one understood me, no one cared about me. Um, and that there was no future for me. How much of these, Ryan, are the are recurring themes for you? How often do you hear this? I mean, yeah, I, I think drug use is is pretty rampant through through the homeless community. I, I think, I mean, one thing it tells me straight away is the wrong, or let's say not say wrong, but the attitude that we all have towards drug users mm-hmm. is. To blame the user? Uh, to blame the user, exactly, is a, is a problem, you know. And, and there's a great book by a, a bloke named Johan Hari um, called Chasing the Scream who, who really talks about this in a great way in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of this is, a, this is very much people falling into an issue mm. that they never really had that much of a choice in. And, uh, you know... To me, that, that's so important to understand. So walking in the space, a space like Rough Edges, that's what I want all our volunteers to know um, is, you know, how, do, how should we look at drug users and, and things like that. But in terms of, of mental illness, I find, um, I find mental illness, again, is pretty rampant in roughies. Um, we see a lot of people coming in with that. Um, and it, I, I think that the stress, the... the the pure anxiety that that you often feel when you're in homelessness just accentuates it mm. so much more. Um, Remember, um, we want to hear from you as well, so please uh, send your questions through. We'll get some to some of those questions. We've been talking about homelessness, what it means, the experience of it, what contributes to it, the impact of mental illness, the impact of drug use. But, of course, there is another side to this too. There is... The future, and how do you find a future? What gives you hope for the future? Um, That's a great question, Stan, and I would like to answer it. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah. No, um, I I think the big thing we we really wanted people to walk away from rough edges is with is that they matter. And, uh, you know, there, there's a dignity message within that. There's a value message within that. But also there's a value add message within that. So, you know, things that we've been working on most recently is a program called New Skills. Um, and that's about giving people opportunity to give, to, to add value to the Rough Edges community specifically. Um, because, because that's all about mattering, you know, that... that that we value you, but you add value um, is, is so important. And so, yeah, th- I, I think the big thing is is uh, mattering and dignity that that we really we really try to to champion, I suppose. <laughs> Grace, 
Is it on? Uh, how's this one? That now it's now it's operating. Okay, Grace. Before we started this conversation, you said something to me um, that I think we need to hear. And and you know, listening to Ryan and Ryan's talking there about the work that rough edges can do and people mattering and making people believe that you know that they do matter. But you said something as well. You said, "But don't give me advice." What did you mean by that? Oh, it's just I've been into services before and I'm just more venting and they start saying, well, have you, have you tried this? Have you tried this? And I'm saying, yes, I've tried that. Yes, I've tried that. And I find, I find it a little bit insulting because it's like I've been, I know about all the services, I've been trying to do this. I even told them, look, I run legal aid. But and so someone will say, get does. a job. And you go, uh, hello. Yeah. Um, you think I don't <laughs> want my job. <laughs> yeah, I think that's nothing about being homeless so young. They just think, oh, you can just get a job. You can't get a job without a house. Who's going to give a homeless person a job? I had a few jobs like putting up posters and that kind of, you know, handing out flyers, but not a proper job. <laughs> so what do you want if it's not advice... Oh, just to someone say that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of empathy. You, you, Ryan, it's listening a lot of the time, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I tend to find, uh, you know, a lot of the time people already know the answer that they're looking for. You know, I, I've had a, a conversation where a guy came in and, and gave and basically told me, you know, five major issues that were happening in his life. And so... the. You know, the question was, well, which one do you have to knock over first? Right. And, and he knew, you know, he had an ice addiction. I need to knock that. Like, that's got to go. Uh, and I said, how are you going to do it? And he, and he knew the answer, you know. Like, he knew where he was going to go and get that. But it was, it's just that listening factor that needs to happen before, before any action can take place. And you, I think people just need to know you're in it with them. You're, you're sitting in the darkness with them kind of thing and rather than trying to turn on a light somewhere. Or, or and it sucks. And it sucks. Yes. It sucks big time. Lizzie, you said something before. You said when you were at your lowest, you, you had a second family. And I'm just wondering about that support and that messaging and, and whether what Grace said resonates with you that even people who may care and love you and want the best can sometimes get it wrong or you're not hearing what you want to hear or you're not ready to hear. What was your experience? Yeah, well, for me, it was quite different. I, my entire life, had gone through my family issues, my mental health by myself. I never opened up to anyone. I dealt with it all just purely by myself. So for me, it was almost the opposite in learning to trust people, to let them in and to know that I'm not alone. I'm not doing this on my own. Like, I have people there to support me. And honestly, in my lowest of lows, I kept going for them. So without that, I probably wouldn't be here today. How do you build trust? It's a good question. Because I, when, when you said that, <laughs> I thought, oh, that's a big word. And when you say trust, and you, and you said I, I had to build trust, and I thought, how do you build trust? So when I was at the worst situations, when I was having breakdowns, when I couldn't get up in the morning, they were there for me constantly. They didn't turn a blind eye. They didn't just brush me off. They were there when I thought no one was there for me. And I think that's, I guess, where my trust has come from. Does it, Tony, is it also a question of judgment? Um the unconditionality of love and support without judgment. Is that what's important as well? It's very important because, um, I mean, none of us like to be judged, especially none of us like to be judged harshly. And when you're going through an extremely hard time, um, being homeless is, um, being judged by someone who doesn't understand it and doesn't know the reasons why you became homeless, doesn't know what the answer to it all is and is simply trying to guess at what it is and getting it wrong, um, it's really offensive um, and it hurts. And you know, it then becomes very difficult to even want to have a conversation with that person. Um, and did you, did you feel judged a lot of the time, when, even when people were ostensibly there to support or help, that you felt as if you were judged? Was that your experience? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, that has been my experience from early childhood right um, through. And it even continues to this day um, that people tend to look at me and make assumptions about me, um, that they know more about my life or what the reasons for it all is or are, and they don't have a clue. They have no idea who I am, what my story is, and every time that happens, it always tends to be a negative stereotype. They've always got a view of me that isn't true and is demeaning, that's putting me down. And I hate that. Grace, it's interesting as well. And, and look, we're all guilty of this. I've probably been guilty of it myself. You see someone um, and they're apparently or even obviously homeless and there's a pity. Mm. Or, um, and, you know, pity can be a really, um, you know, it can be a really demeaning thing in some ways. Yeah. It? It, it can sort of be a patronising thing in some ways. Totally. Um, I remember, like, I was, you could tell I was homeless by looking at me. You could tell that I was a drug user by looking at me. And I'd walk around with my green bag and I just feel like people could just see me coming and were, like, just avoiding me. And I also felt like here's stuff on, like, I felt like everyone was looking at me thinking, well, she must have ripped her family off. That's why she's not with her family. She must have done something wrong. So we just assume that about drug users. And then you see stuff on Current Affair about, like, um, if they just had willpower. And mm. there's even bumper stickers saying to shoot heroin addicts. It's like, it, if, and I think, oh, if they met me, they wouldn't want to shoot me. But, you know, you can't help but take it personally. And it's funny too, Ryan, because there is this idea, and we have have this in society that you know you've got to try harder and um pull yourself up by the boot mm. laces and you know you, you you've got to do it for yourself and that we get that messaging all the time it's not that easy and hard work is often not its own reward either you can work very hard yeah and still find yourself struggling absolutely i i just i think i mean what i see time and time again is a fear that, that comes into play for people a, a lot. So, I mean, if we talk about, say, what you were saying, giving people advice or just just casework, as it were, which is just supporting someone and, and you know, uh, you know, in casework you ask the person to, to play a part in, the, in their in the journey, I suppose. But let's say that person doesn't pull off what their goals were for the week, they come back with that sense of failure and, and that's a feeling in itself that, that they're terrified of. And so, you know, it, it becomes this kind of uh, self... Uh, fulfilling thing. Self-fulfilling, yeah. yeah exactly. You don't want to go back after you haven't done it. You, yeah, you yeah. miss the next <laughs> appointment. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we can talk a lot about failure and what goes wrong and what we get wrong and, and how we often with the best of intentions, um, make mistakes. But I also want to now look at, at the positives of what you bring to it. Lizzie, what did you learn about yourself? I mean, here you are studying at university with this extraordinary future ahead of you, having gone through the lowest of, of, of lows and, and trying to take your own life. But what did you learn about yourself in those moments? I learned that I was a lot more resilient than, than I gave myself credit for. Um, I managed to sit up here today and talk about my experience and find housing to recover from some of the trauma that I went through and be able to walk out every day and live my life. Tony, what, did you what have you learned about yourself? I've learnt that um, I'm a stronger person than I thought I was and that I'm a better person than I thought I was. Um, what, what, what do you mean a better person than you thought you were? People, you know, when I was growing up, people always told me I was a bad kid um, and that everything that was going wrong was my fault. Um, I now realise that I'm not a bad person. I'm a person who actually cares about other people a great deal. And when you care about other people and help people, well, you can't be that bad, now can you? Um... And also, I also realised that a lot of what was going on wasn't my fault at all. Um, so that's, I mean, a lot of what was happening was not my fault, but I felt it was. Yeah, I can really... And I, I felt that I was a bad kid because I was told I was. Mm. I now realise that I'm actually a pretty good bloke. <laughs> I can vouch for that. Having just, just met you, I can vouch for that. What, what about you, Grace? What, what did you... Oh. I mean, what, what you were describing before and, you know... 
two percent of people get off heroin. Mm. It's 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 hard. I what have you learned about yourself? I looked it up and it said one percent. One. <laughs> and then my sister said, no, it's it's hundred percent better. It's two percent. I think the best <laughs> I've read is five percent. Right. Um, so but, what did you learn about yourself? Um, well, I'll say resilience as well, but um, and also not how much you can get used to. Not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> like right. I remember the first time I had to. Um, I was, Anyway, probably shouldn't go into that. But you get used to things, bad things, too easily. <laughs> and it, it, the, life becomes very normal, even yeah, in the worst yeah, like, circumstances. Yeah, yeah, when at first it's like, I can't believe I'm doing this. And then after a couple of years, you're like, oh, that's normal. Mm. <laughs> and then it's good when I'm doing the tours. I'm like, I used to do that. Um, but um, also just how resourceful you become. Like, I used to paint big buckets of water black, so when I got home in the afternoon, I'd see them in the sun, so it was hot, so then you could, like, have a shower. I used to use tea bags as floss, and just, like, you know, you become resourceful. So you got to. What was the turning point, Grace? Mm. Is, is there just one, or is it, you know, two steps forward and a step back, or a step sideways, or is there, is there a moment for you that stands out? Some act, some person, yourself, a moment that changed things for you? I mean, what changed for me mainly was the bad things happening at once. That's what stopped me using in that. But what changed, like, what people on the street that helped me and that, that really helped was um, just little things like someone walking past and giving me a Slurpee and just looking me in the eyes and saying, like, if I used to go around asking people for change. It's like, just look at me yeah. and say no. Just to feel invisible and it's like... It was just that, yeah, wasn't nice. <laughs> so that, that made you... Just say no. Right. <laughs> Even yeah. just say no, just but like, did, look at me. <laughs> did, did that make you feel like you had to make a change? Yeah, is well, that, well I was just so sick a... of being sick and I knew my lifestyle, lifestyle wasn't sustainable. Hmm. But, yeah, um, and I did want to stop using, but, like, and I knew my life wouldn't change unless I stopped using. But um, I just didn't think I could. But, yeah... <laughs> Lizzie, was, was there something, some moment, I mean, was it the moment when you realised I can either die or I can get the treatment I need? Yeah, it was definitely um, when I attempted to take my own life. Um, that for me, laying there helpless with all the people I love around me, I realised that I have one of two options. I can either give in to what's going on and what's happened to me or I can try my hardest to get back out there, and that's what I did. Tony, for you. Um, I can think of three, actually. The first um, was when I was 16 years old, and I stayed at um, a Mission Australia Youth Refuge on the North Shore called Clifton Lodge for two months. Um, and that was the first time people started telling me, actually, you're not a bad kid, Tony. We think you've got a lot of potential. They'd listened to what I was saying about my life, and they didn't judge, and they supported me as best they could. Um, then in my mid-twenties I became a Christian. Um, that was useful because I started to see a better way to live and I started to build support networks. And the third time was when I was 30 and that was when I was actually diagnosed with clinical depression for the first time by a GP and started taking medication for it. Something that made sense. This explained behaviour. Yes, that's right. And, and Faith, you know, you, you mentioned Christianity. How did that come into your life and, and what difference did that make to your life? Um, I started looking at Christianity because I knew my life was out of control. In my early 20s, I thought to myself that by the time I'm 30, I'm either going to be dead from suicide or a motorcycle accident because riding motorcycles very fast when you're drunk or stoned or whatever it's is a good subtle. way to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or I was going to wind up in jail because I was dealing drugs. If they'd caught me, I'd have gone to jail. Um, or I was going to wind up in a psych hospital. Um, I didn't like those options. I started looking around and I found Christianity because um, it was what I was looking for. It's what I needed to find. Is this where Rough Edges comes in, do you think, Ryan? It's, you know, building on what people themselves bring to their lives. And not everyone is going to be as strong and not everyone's going to be at a position where they can, you know, turn their lives around, to use that phrase. But what does Rough Edges bring at this point? Yeah, so 
Uh, for us, we, we really focus on community, first of all. So, um, you know, all our vol volunteers and, and holler to our volunteers, an amazing bunch of people. Um, all our volunteers actually go through a weekend of training um, before they, they start volunteering at Ruffies. Um, and, you know, what that is about is basically injecting people with, uh, you know, that have been told to listen, told to empathise, told to... Uh, um, gently be with people, I suppose, um, and, and creating a community that, that does likewise, that, to empathise, to listen with each other. Um, we, we try to invite a, a, a few other services that, that focus around, I, I guess, giving dignity. So, um, so I mean, we, we have our, our legal service um, run by our lawyer, lawyer Belinda, who's, uh, you know, does an amazing job of just uh, supporting people through legal issues. Um, we have uh, a haircut group that come in and, and give people haircuts. We have uh, Orange Sky Laundry that come to us on a Friday to, to give laundry service and, and basically just just help people with those those little things that, that, that you know, we all kind of take for granted but are essential for us. Um, and then the other thing that we try to do is just partner with people and, and walk the journey with them. So what do you need? How can we help? You know, and, and you're in charge, you drive, but we'll be with you uh, along the way. Yeah, um, children top up the gas tank. I love that, <laughs> top up the gas tank. Send your questions through. I, I'd love to put some of the questions if you have them as well. Um, we've got fantastic panel here with us so um, please send your questions through and I can put them to, to the panellists here. Um, uh, before we go to some of those questions, Tony were there, there moments of kindness that stand out for you that made a difference? Um, oh, there's been many. Um, the last time I was homeless was actually about three years ago um, when I was kicked out of my boarding house simply because the, the landlord wanted to renovate the room and he wanted to move me into a smaller room I couldn't fit what furniture I had in there, so he told me to throw it out on the footpath. I told him I'm not going to do it, so he kicked me out. If it hadn't been for John and Catherine um, allowing me to couch surf at their place for two months, I would have been back to sleeping on the street. Um, and that was just three years ago. Yeah. Um, there have been so many over the years, it's hard to keep track of them all. Yeah. There's a great question. I'll put this one to you, Grace. How do we create belonging and inclusion as a member of the street community. And it's important to remember that, isn't it? We are talking about not just individuals, but a community of people. And did you find that a sense of belonging and inclusion? And if not, how do you create that? I did. Um, like, I was always with other homeless people and that sort of thing. And like, there was the other homeless people that always told me about all which services to go to and that where I could stay and where Scots were and that sort of thing. Um, but. It wasn't like still I'd be worried to sleep by myself because I'd be nervous, but then the people that I'd have around me, would I'd end up with just stuff stolen or wake up being groped or that sort of thing. So, kind of. <laughs> Tony, what can people do to build a stronger sense of community? Um, basically, they have to be there for each other, um, talk to each other, listen to each other, um, not judge help each other as best they can with whatever they've got. There's a great question here, Ryan. I'll put this one to you. Um, what are things people can do to end homelessness? It's um, ending homelessness, of course, if it, was, yeah. if it was that easy, of course, it would be done. But, but not, just, not just people who are experiencing homeless, homelessness, but as a community, because I'm fully aware, you know, when, when we get the every year with the federal budget delivered, I work in the media, no one talks about homelessness, mm -hmm. no one. We don't see people marching in the streets um, in protests about ending homelessness. Um, we do about a whole lot of other issues, but we don't see that. They're often invisible. Homelessness does not change governments. People don't vote on issues of homelessness. And yet we all share in this. So we're talking about things people can do to end it. Yeah. What do we all have to do? I think that the first thing is, I mean, there's some small things, and that is just educate yourself. Um, try to understand homelessness as best you can. Uh, that that it's 
that it's not an us versus them kind of situation or it's not a lazy or choice situation. Um, I think the other, the other things we need to be doing is advocating for, for you know, better housing conditions. Like, if, if we talk about Darlinghurst, where Rough Edges exists, we've seen, anyone have a guess at, or anyone know how much housing prices have risen in the about, last 20 years? Oh, my oh, goodness. In from. the last 20 years? Yeah. In the last year? It's about the last years. Year on year room. on year. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's prohibitive. People can't afford to buy a Exactly. Place. Buy? Yeah. <laughs> Rent, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the, that's the, the big piece of the puzzle right there is creating space that that people can actually afford to live in and it it shouldn't be that hard for a country like Australia to to have people to have housing for people Um, and so that's the first thing just just advocate keep it at the front of our, our our leaders minds that there needs to be more housing in this country that people can afford we don't have housing for people we have housing for profit don't we Exactly, yeah. And, and the strange thing about all of that is that it actually costs state governments more money to leave someone sleeping in a park than it does to put them in social housing, um, simply because of all the support services, you know, like ambulances and hospital emergency departments and community mental health services, all those sorts of services. Um, if we spent less time knocking down rebuilding football stadiums, more money spending, <laughs> um, more money on social housing, it would actually cost the state government And Tony's money. a football fan too. He yeah. Wins. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Big Bunny's fan. A bit, so am I. I'm, yeah. st- I'm still recovering, Tony. Yeah. Yeah, still well, recovering. That close. Too close. Anyway, we'll save 20, that. Hey, 22 we'll, and 22. We'll save that. Yeah, well, hopefully. Um, how do you get your voice heard, Grace? Because I said before, homelessness is, and homeless people are often invisible politically. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I suppose, I mean, I really like doing good tours because I can ha- have people give me some kind of, em- like, I hope, I try and get give people empathy to tell right. them actually the story. Um, I just try and pick people to remember, like, that they don't have the same opportunities and everything too, but uh, it's a hard one. <laughs> There's a great question here. I'll put this one to you, Lizzie. What is the best way to engage with a person experiencing homelessness? I would have to say with compassion. It's one of the most important things, I think, to listen to someone, to not judge them and to just show them respect. That's often all someone's looking for. They're not asking you to solve their problems. They know you can't solve their problems with a $5 note. They're not asking for that. They're just asking for someone to listen to them and to be heard. This is a great question, Tony. Um, What is the least accurate stereotype and how do we combat these stereotypes? And we touched on this a little bit earlier, didn't we? But you know, the, the, the common sort of image of, of a homeless person is this person sleeping rough and you went through the four different areas mm. um, where we misunderstand that. So what's the least accurate stereotype, do you think? Uh, the least accurate stereotype is that um, homeless people are just lazy. It's actually really hard work being homeless <laughs> because you wake up, you've got to find somewhere to eat. You've got to find somewhere to have a shower. Um, there's all sorts of things you've got to do um, it's not a question of these people, you know, homeless people want to just lie there, uh, lay around um, and be dull bludgers. That's, you know, that's just complete rubbish. It's not what it is. Um, how, do you, how to combat that? Well, it really is just education. It's people sitting down, having a conversation with people, getting to know them, getting to know what the issues are and finding out firsthand... Um, this is what the real deal is. Well, what do you think, Grace? The stereotypes. Um, I think there's a big stereotype. Like, because we're in Australia, we've got Centrelink, we've got Medicare, we've got housing. Like, why would you be homeless? We've got these services, um, but the services don't work the way that people do. Like, ten, ten year waiting list. Yeah, ten year waiting list. And if you get priority, it's meant to be a year, but still like three six years. Um, and often they um, they 
mail the homeless people letters and if you're homeless you don't get a letter and then you get kicked off the list and I've been kicked off the list after four so years and I'm like what's the point um, yeah. another stereotype which I find really annoying is um, people just think that you're an old man on a park bench because <laughs> I don't look like a, like, like since I don't look homeless yeah like, you know they just think you're not homeless well I did before but yes <laughs> they just think you like think that all homeless that's good for people they see but like you said we're invisible most of us. You said something before about <laughs> drug use, and I think it applies equally to homelessness, doesn't it? Um, oh, yeah. I, Ryan, blame, mm. blame the person. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's the big thing. I, I think get curious. Um, if anyone's been watching Ted Lasso, there's a great quote on that um, where he, I think he said something like, uh, don't get judgmental, get curious. And I love that saying because it, it just goes, well, well, let's ask a few questions here. Why is this person in this situation? What's happened? Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what I, that's my big thing, I, I think, at the moment. That's, that's what I've been trying to tell myself lately, get curious. It, it sort of goes to this next question in a way, shifting community perception and driving the conversation. I mean, this conversation is really important. Um, everybody tuning in here and people sending through questions, this is really important. And this conversation needs to be heard more widely, but how do we, Ryan, shift that and drive the conversation? Is the media interested, do you think, or or do we just get the current affair stories that Grace was talking about? You know, oh, I saw it was a current affair one. I'm talking about homeless people stealing a million dollar views from down at Circular oh, Key, <laughs> and it's like really now. <laughs> yeah, as if it's those upsetting. views aren't free for everyone. <laughs> yeah, they're not, not a million dollar view. <laughs> yes, don't, don't, you don't own the view. Um, <laughs> what, what 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 changes that conversation, right? I think, I mean, one thing I'd say is come and volunteer, you know, and, and meet people. It's really hard to not like people that you've met, you know. Like once you get close to someone and you actually hear their story and, and hear their background, it really makes a, a massive difference. And don't get me wrong, there's people there that, that will drive you nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, there's people in, in most rooms that will drive you nuts, right? So... Um, it's really hard to, to, to walk away from volunteering at Rough Edges or Wayside Chapel or any of the other services and go, I still don't think uh, people are giving themselves a fair go or whatever. That or they're not trying hard enough. They're not trying hard enough. You don't walk away from a, an experience like Rough Edges with that thought in your mind. Yeah, how do people volunteer? What, what are you looking for? What can people do? How much time... Do people need to give? How do we get that drive going? Yeah, um, so we ask people to volunteer for um, about a th usually three hours. During COVID, it's been one and a half. <laughs> um, usually three hours a shift every fortnight. And, uh, you know... And those shifts are across what? The day, night? It's a nighttime shift usually. We do have Wednesdays and Fridays where we, we run a lunchtime service. Um, and what we're looking for are, are people that are great listeners, people that are, are fun and, and engaging and, you know, um, and if you're not that, come along anyway because we've got a lot of fun and engaging volunteers. And, and how you do can people... can wash dishes. Yeah. We can wash, wash dishes. dishes, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do people volunteer? Do you, do you turn up? What, what's the process? Yeah, so we do have a bit of an in-depth service uh, uh, process. Uh, so um, the first thing is to come to an information session and we just want you to know what you're in for, basically. The second thing is to do a training, which, which uh, does come at a, a cost, but we're very proud of the training we offer. Um, and then we'll have you on the roster soon after. Mm, fantastic. Um, let me ask you this, Lizzie. There's a question here that asks... And these are fantastic questions, by the way. Thank you so much for sending them through. Um, we're getting close to the, to the end of time, but um, keep them coming because we get through as many as we can. What types of early intervention are most important? What would have made a difference? In, you, you said something that struck me, and I, I didn't get a chance to follow it up then, but I will now. You kept everything quiet and private. You went through this alone. What type of early intervention would have made a difference for you? Well, I think um, people sharing their story is such a powerful thing. I think if I was back in school and I heard someone talk about their lived experience with mental health, then I probably would feel more comfortable reaching out to someone and letting them know what I was going through. But I just thought I was alone. I thought I was the only one facing that and I didn't want to 
speak up about it. Um, and at home was no option to speak up? No. Obviously, at home, that's where all my problems came from. So I wasn't really going to turn to my parents, yeah. What, what about for you, Grace? Would, would early... You, you, it was quite a similar story in some ways um, because you said you wanted to hide things from your, your family. What would have made a difference? What would have stopped you going on that slide? I just wish we'd spoken about it. We still haven't really spoken about it. Like, Mum, they knew I was stoned and she must have known. And, like, they got told by the police there was needles. And they're like, why do you have needles? I'm like, to measure out the drugs? Like, they would have known. <laughs> um, yeah, but Mum used to just those... say, you look tired. And, mm. yeah, so we never really spoke about it. That, that, that might have been her way to try to have the conversation. Um, yeah, that was her way of saying, you look stoned. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a parent and I know there are, it's hard to have conversations and sometimes they don't want to listen. But also, sometimes you... Who, who was it who said earlier... You, Lizzie, you said people are scared of the answer. I think... Um, are people scared of the answer? I think people are also scared what to say. Like, I did... I was raped when I was 15 and I told my parents about it and they never spoke to me about it. And I think that's part of the reason I moved out too because I just wanted to change schools because I was weird at schools. And I used to think that if you change the situation, you'd be happier. But wherever you go, you take yourself with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but I wish, wish I'd talked about it earlier because... Yeah, it's just so silly I didn't say anything. I'm yeah. still annoyed about the same things. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Tony, what, what are some of the ways we can break the cycle of chronic homelessness? Okay, I mean, obviously we need more housing, but we also need more support services. We need... Um, there's outreach services. I used to work for Mission Australia's Mission Beat Service, um, which these days does a lot of outreach work with... Uh, driving around the inner city area in vans and talking to people, um, getting them into crisis accommodation. Um, from crisis accommodation, people can then move out into uh, more permanent accommodation, but often they're going to need support services um, to, you know, like counselling and talking through um, issues through health issues or budget issues or help getting onto Centrelink benefits. Um, there's all sorts of services that people will need help with um, that then help them help themselves. Mm. And we need more of those. Ryan, Roughtober is about raising money. Um, it's about raising funds and, and, ra and through raising awareness and these types of conversations. What do you need to do the work that you need to do? Yeah, again, a great as question. As much as possible, right? <laughs> big question. Um, look, uh, what, we, what we're trying to, to gain is pr professional staff. Um, you know, in, in the last little while, actually just today, we, we hired a, another social worker. Um, we, we need to, to hire probably another social worker yet. Um, and so the, the first thing is, is just professional staff. I, I think... Um, you know, when you talk about ending chronic homelessness, it really, it, you know, homelessness, as you're probably picking up at this time, is an extremely difficult sort of situation to, to bring people through and requires a whole lot of, of gaining trust and building that, that uh, network of, um, of services that can assist people. And so, um, yeah, I, I think... I think uh, the the professional staff do go a long way, and I, I think and you need the money to do that too, the right? Money to do that exactly. Yeah. So so you need and the people resources to, that go with it. You need people to donate. You need yep. people to get out there and support you. You need people to participate over Rough Tober. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And volunteer. Yeah. And, and volunteer and, and, and be and part of it. Yeah. Is it is it harder now because of COVID? Is it harder to get yep. people to engage? Oh, I. There's just no comparison, you know. That I, I think when I say we we really focus on community, it was a, you know a thousand times harder trying to have a community when we couldn't let people in the space. Um, and so you know, f for throughout lockdown, we've been running a takeaway food only service, and. You know, the, the purpose behind that was to just be a consistent uh, place of support for people. Um, and, you know, it, it's nowhere near as much fun for us 
you know, as a service and, and fun is an important value, um, that, that we don't have the ability to just sit down with someone. Um, and even now that we're all coming out of, of lockdown, we don't have the ability to sit down with someone without kind of, uh, you know, thinking, how do we greet you? Can I shake your hand? Can yeah, I fist bump? Can I, you know, like... Yeah. All these things are now so much more difficult. They get in the way of people volunteering and feeling if they should volunteer or can volunteer. Can volunteer. Uh, you know, we, we had a lot of volunteers drop out for the time because, you know, they, they had their own situations with um, health issues or a family member who had health issues. It was, um, it was a nightmare, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Well, you thankfully... You can't smile with a mask on either. That no, you can't. terrible. Yeah. Thankfully, we are coming out of that. Um, we're out of time now. It's very hot here, I can tell you. We've been <laughs> yeah. sitting under these lights and I think we're all sweating. Um, thank you so much for sending through uh, your questions. I, I want to thank, again, um, all of you for being up here and, and sharing the story. Ryan, Grace... Uncle Tony and Lizzie, thank you so much for being so honest um, and so giving and so generous to be able to share that, uh, those stories with us. I want to thank the tech group for providing the behind the scenes expertise and bringing up the second microphone for me after my microphone died halfway through the, uh, the, the interview. Um, again, this is a fundraising event. So, as we heard, we need volunteers, we need support, we need people to make sure that we don't lose another generation. We want to see more Graces and Tonys and Lizzies up here next year when we come back and talk. We want to see fewer people having to sleep on the street. So I encourage you to continue to reach out to your sponsors, ask them to support you. The funds raised from this event will ensure that Rough Edges can also continue running next year. If you'd like to find out how to support Rough Edges or get involved, the website is www.roughedges.org. Ryan, that's it, www.roughedges.org. Yeah. Yep, that's the one. Any other ways people can find you? Um, Facebook. Yep, Snap, all uh, the socials. Snapchat. <laughs> Snapchat. Snapchat. Instagram, Instagram, yeah, Instagram, okay. Facebook. Um, yeah. So you're, you're open to, to all of that as well. Thank you again to all of you tuning in and being part of this conversation and to um, this very special discussion that we were able to have. Thank you all. It was a fantastic hour or so to spend with you. Good luck with your exams. Thank you, I need it. You will <laughs> absolutely kill it. Thank you so much um, for being with us. Oh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. And thank you, Stan. Thank you, Stan.